This episode of Show Me the Meaning is brought to you by Nordic Track and Movie. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Show Me the Meaning, Wisecracks Movie Podcast. Show Me the Meaning! My name is Jared, and with me is the Show Me the Meaning crew. We got Ryan. Hey, film fans. And Austin. And joining us from the Projection Booth Podcast, the ultimate movie podcast, Mike White. How's it going, Mike? Good. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Doing so awesome. I was on uh, Mike's Hello. podcast recently. It hasn't come out yet, but we talked about the uh, Michael Haneke movie, The Piano Teacher, which I uh, ashamedly told him on his podcast that I'd seen four times. <laughs> so uh, definitely check out Mike's podcast. Uh, thanks for coming with us, Mike, on this journey well, to talk about The Shining. Welcome. Absolutely. All right, guys. So before we start talking about The Shining, which is the movie we're going to be talking about today, a couple things I want to go over. First of all, uh, gonna have another call to you guys. Please give us a review on iTunes. If everyone listening to this spent three minutes giving us a review on iTunes, it would basically change our lives. So if you guys have the three minutes, <laughs> it would be super epic if you guys left us a review. Uh, other thing I want to reveal is we uh, did another poll on uh, our Patreon, which is at wisecrackplus.com, about what our patrons want us to talk about for the next movie. And so uh, Ryan picked two films, Austin picked two films, and I picked two films, and the results are in. So first let me list Dude, off the, the two films. The suspension has been killing me. You mean I, the suspense? I, I, I really, yeah, whatever. I came to win. <laughs> I, <laughs> I came to win, and I hope I won. All right. Reveal it. All right, do you guys want it to say, okay, the two movies that I picked, I picked Akira and I picked Batman v Superman. Okay. What movies did you pick, Ryan? I picked. Oh God, I have a bad feeling now. I picked Starship Troopers and I picked Human Centipede first sequence. And Austin, which two did? I picked Pain and Gain and Antichrist. Okay. Oh my God. You guys ready for the results? <laughs> yeah. Do you want me, want me to go in order I'll, or from top to bo bottom? Bottom to top. Go from top bottom to top. Bottom to top. Yeah, okay. Bottom to top. <laughs> we got the least. All right. In last place with 18 votes is Pain and Gain. Oh man, I like that movie. <laughs> people, people, it's a good movie. Uh, Y'all don't understand. Underrated. This is Michael Bay's stalker. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Mike, have you seen that movie? I have. That is one of the few Michael Bay's I really like. You know, See? I actually haven't seen it. Oh, dude. That's interesting to, to hear that. Okay. And uh, all right. So next one with 21 votes, the second to last place is Austin. Sorry, bro. Antichrist. Oh, no. <laughs> People. What the I'm fuck, with you man? on that one. I'm with you on that one. Oh, I fucking man, I love it. it. I, I love made it Antichrist. one third of the way through. All right. If I got the last two and we're watching Batman versus <laughs> oh, Superman, I'm going to fucking jump out my window. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Have you seen Batman v Superman yet? Yes, I've seen. Oh, you it. have. Well, We've gone through oh, this. Okay, okay, all right, all right. And then I turned it off. Okay, all right. Next in uh, third from last place fourth, is fourth from last place. Right. Fourth from last place. Excuse me. Is with twenty-eight votes. <gasps> Human Centipede. Boo! <laughs> Boo! What's wrong with you? Hey, man, they did better than Antichrist in Pain and Game. I guess. But all, right. all right, third place with thirty votes. It was ahead of its time. Is. Batman v Superman. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And this is actually, it's kind of a squeaker between the first and second place. Oh, second no. place with 52 votes is Starship oh, Troopers. Fuck me. <laughs> wow. God. That means number one with 58 votes Akira. is Akira. <sighs> so, okay. Well, that's cool. That is cool. So last week I was sick. We were supposed to be talking squeaker. about Gone Girl. Uh, so we ended up not doing that. We actually ended up releasing a patron-only thing that was supposed to be for our patrons only, which was on the Star Wars Backlash. But because I got sick, we just were like, well, shit, we don't have something to upload. So we just uploaded that. So That turned out but, awesome, by the way. Oh, thank you. So yeah. for those of you who are not patrons, you got a little taste of what we usually give to our patrons. So if you're interested in more stuff like that, check out wisecrackplus.com. <laughs> anyway... All right, guys, so today we're talking about the 1980 film The Shining, starring Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall, directed by the man, Stanley Kubrick. Uh, so let's go ahead and get some first impressions. Let's start this time with Austin. Tell us about this movie, Austin. So this might be surprising. This is the first time I've actually ever seen The Shining. Oh, oh my God. Wow. I know. I I know. I uh, I feel like I already had seen it just by watching clips or watching documentaries about it, including Room Two Three Seven, which I think is. Whoa! Awesome. You watched Room Two Three Seven before you watched The Shining, homie. What, I've read so you, much Austin? about this movie that I feel like I've seen it. Um, okay. You know, I, I guess. there was nothing in it that surprised me. 
That didn't mean I still didn't enjoy it, but literally I've read so much about it and seen so many clips on it and video essays, and I've read people talking about themes in it that it was like I had seen the movie. So I, n- I never was, was interested because I was like, I, I get it, you know? So this was the first time I'd seen it, and uh, I, in a way I kind of agree with everything I just said, and in a way I'm also kind of wrong because it sort of supersedes even all of those analyses and things like that because – the tension that's built and the sort of thematic resonance that's built throughout the two and a half hours is is really lovely. And so I have thoughts, I will say, but I think it's fan fucking tastic. All right, cool, Mike. What about you? Uh, I have seen this movie before, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is always great to return to. Uh, I don't know how many times I've seen it over the years. This is uh, I. I uh, have told this story before, but this is one of the few films that ever made me viscerally sick the first time that I saw it. It wasn't, uh, I didn't throw up, but I got a really bad headache. And I think it was that high pitched shining noise when that would come on, I would just kind of freak out. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Awesome. Ryan. Yeah. I've seen this movie like probably a dozen times in my life. And, um, I, it's one of those few movies that I really do believe is totally different in the movie theater because I saw probably like the first five times just on at home and I loved it. I always every time it's an A plus, but but uh, but in the theater it was such a crazy experience. It, I, I felt the tension way more. Kind of that sick feeling you're talking about. I definitely was more terrorized when I watched it with a whole group of people in a in a dark theater. So that's what I would say about that movie. Is that is that, is that watching it? This time, for like the dozenth time back at home, I was kind of like, man, this movie was really way better in a movie theater, even though I still love it. How many it. times have you seen it in a theater? Twice. I think I at was the, there with you once at yeah. the Egyptian. Yeah. yeah. And how awesome was that? You know? and, and yeah, that was awesome. Do you agree with me? I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I like this movie a lot. It's definitely not top tier Kubrick for me. Um, for me, it is. It's one of, I think it's strangely more accessible movies and. Is not top tier Kubrick still top tier in American? Well, I guess he's British, but we'll say Western cinema, or is it? Does it kind of? He is a he is a Brooklynite. He's as American as they come. I don't give a shit if he moved to London, you know, in his (laughs) in his later years. Um, Didn't he talk with an accent though? No, I think he sounds like just a regular dude. Yeah. Oh, does a regular American dude? A (laughs) dude, surprisingly. Um, What about you, Jared? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's funny, like. Part of the reason we're doing this is because uh, next month, the second episode of our new pilot show, The Film Tourist, in which I talk about like film form while inhabiting the scene of movies, is on The Shining. And I watched the movie so many times for that, that it kind of didn't really do anything for me this run. But like Ryan, I had this very pure memory in my mind of seeing it at the Egyptian, seeing it in a theater, seeing it at a, a great theater, and how powerful it is. This is one of the most fun movies to think about, but at the same time, I feel like maybe even a lot of this podcast is just going to be calling bullshit on a lot of stuff. Because, by the way, I know we can do Room 237 for another podcast, but Ryan knows my feelings about that movie. I fucking hate that movie. I fucking love that movie. (laughs) I hate it. I love it. (laughs) Room 237 is a movie that totally... It's just a documentary about the wrong subject. It shouldn't... like. What's interesting about Room 237 is that you have these people making these outlandish jumps of logic... And the question that the interesting question is, who the fuck are these people? But we never see their faces. We never see these individuals. What a bold choice. Yeah. A a bold (laughs) choice doesn't mean it's a good choice. (laughs) That was interesting. Uh, But anyway. All right. Let's go into a recap. And then I can't wait to talk to you guys about. I'm curious. How much of the room 237 stuff do you guys buy? How much of it do you think is BS? What meanings Mm. do you actually walk away with from this movie? 59.4%. We'll go it. we'll, We'll get into it. Okay. All right, guys, on to the recap. So, teacher-turned-frustrated writer Jack Torrance, along with his wife Wendy and young son Danny, arrive at the Overlook Hotel, where they will work as the hotel's caretakers for the winter. Before Jack is handed the keys, he's warned that the previous caretaker lost his mind and killed his family. Meanwhile, Danny meets the cook Halloran, who shares a specific telepathic ability with Danny called Shining. Halloran warns him about Room 237 and then leaves for the winter. Despite Halloran's warning, Danny's curiosity brings him to room 237. Meanwhile, Jack is having horrible nightmares and becomes increasingly irritable. When Danny reappears, apparently beaten, Wendy blames it on Jack. 
Furious at the accusation, Jack drinks for the first time in years and starts to see apparitions. Then he witnesses a disturbing image in room 237 and starts losing his sanity. Jack attends a 1920s-style party in the Gold Room where he meets Dilbert Grady, the previous caretaker who killed his family. Grady informs Jack that Danny is using his abilities to call Halloran back to the hotel and that Jack should correct (laughs) correct them as he did his family. Meanwhile, Danny, under the guise of his imaginary friend Tony, starts writing red rum on the walls. By the time Halloran shows up, Jack is rampaging through the halls trying to track down and kill Danny and Wendy. Jack kills Halloran and pursues Danny through the hedge maze on the outskirts of the hotel. Danny tricks Jack, then he gets lost and freezes to death overnight while Danny and Wendy escape to safety. The final image shows the final image shows a the final image is a fuck me. We're live, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. The final image is the final image shows a track in on a photo hanging on the halls. The final image shows a track in on a photo hanging in the halls of the Overlook Hotel of Jack enjoying the Fourth of July ball in nineteen twenty one. End of movie. All right, guys, now before we move on, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors over at Movie. So what is Movie? Movie is a digital cinema basically there are a certain number of movies playing for 30 days and then once those 30 days are up the movie goes away so there are always 30 movies on the site you have 30 ways to watch a movie and then after that it's gone and each day movie introduces a new gem and you have one month to watch it whether it's an acclaimed masterpiece a cult classic or a film festival darling there are always 30 perfectly curated movies to discover Plus, you can also delve deeper into films with the exclusive interviews, video essays, and critical reviews on Movie's Notebook. Um, So you can get a free trial of Movie for seven days, but if you head to movie.com slash wisecrack, you can get an extended 30-day trial. So um, one of the movies that's playing on Movie right now that is a classic that I've revisited many times is The Producers, the classic Mel Brooks uh, movie that's been remade on Broadway and then there's been a adaptation of the Broadway play on the original, but you can't go wrong with uh, the Mel Brooks classic. Um, springtime for Hitler. Springtime for Hitler, absolutely. Um, and then I think Ryan wanted to talk about a film that's playing. Victoria. If you haven't seen Victoria, it's this German film that was uh, shot in one take. It's like a two-hour movie. They did it on. I think they had like enough time for four takes, and they did it on the third one, or maybe even the last one. I don't know. Read it. It was read yeah, something it. like that. Yeah. Something like I, think that. It, I think it's the second to last one. They just kind of picked the best one. Yeah, overall. and it was it's it's, cool. it's a really cool uh, you know master class in just setting up a take. <laughs> All right, <laughs> watch it. Cool. So if you guys want to try a movie, go to movie.com slash wisecrack for a 30 day free trial. That's 30 movies over 30 days. That's movie.com slash wisecrack for your extended free trial. And back to the show. All right, guys. So there's so much to talk about here. I just want to hear off the bat, just somebody say like, what, what reading do you guys reading of this film do you adhere to? Or like, what do you think is interesting that you've heard? Everyone's heard a million interpretations of this thing. Well, for anyone not familiar with Room 237, you know, it's basically a bunch of, which is what Jared's referencing, there's a whole bunch of conspiracy theories about Stanley Kubrick. One of them is like that he was involved in filming the the moon landing and that there's like all these subtle hints in uh, 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 in the movie. It really is not that subtle. The, Danny is wearing a sweatshirt that says Apollo 11 or okay. something like that. You <laughs> exactly. Know? It's like, I, I, and the, the pattern on the carpet resembles the Apollo missions logo and then 237 could uh, be referring to the distance between the Earth and the Moon, stuff like that. Oh, for fuck's sake! Yeah, I don't believe I don't believe in any of <laughs> Do that. Do you believe that, Austin? No, no, no. Of course not. I do think that it could be possible that that there was some sort of doctoring of images. That that shit doesn't surprise me at all. I, um, whether it's photographs or that things were filmed on a soundstage, that doesn't surprise me. Well, but I'm not a big conspiracy theory guy because ultimately I don't really care. I well, can definitely see Stanley Kubrick literally just trolling the audience by putting out Apollo 11 thing. That in could there. be yeah. it too. That, yeah. could, <laughs> that could be it too. Uh, another one is about the the <clears throat> the Native Americans, um, right? And something. Can you okay. yeah, yeah, articulate? Yeah. All right. So the Native American burial ground yes. is one of the ones. Um, another one is that the, it's a it's a commentary on American imperialism. 
And then another one is that it's secretly about like anti-Semitism. So when Jack does his the big bad wolf thing, the wolf is a, an anti-Semitic character, and so there are all these anti-Semitic themes in there as well. That one I've so never heard. Co- Let me just, let's slow yeah. down. I, well, I want to go from, over the from, na- I want to go over the name two three seven. Oh really? I yeah. rem- I saw that movie at Fantastic Fest. I think Ryan was at that same uh, festival that year. And God, I don't. I just remember like rolling my eyes this whole time, and I'm like, "Who the fuck are these I people?" I was cracking up, man. All right, uh, so let's let's go over the Native American genocide one, just so people are kind of following us with why people think that this is an interpretation of the film. So some people see it as a comment on America's inability to own up to its violent past. So I've heard some people say that the Overlook Hotel is like the hotel itself is a vision of silence. It's like always covering up the past. And, uh, you know, like, so even the guy, what is his name, Ullman, says that it was built on an Indian burial ground, um, considering the visions of violence that were given from the hotel's past. Oh, he says that, yeah, like, its foundations must be soaked to soaked in blood to the core. Um, so, like, I, th- I think that when the blood pours out of the elevator, everything is drowned, everything is tainted. The name Overlook Hotel suggests that we, like, overlook this catastrophe of our past um i don't really buy this but another thing people always back this up by saying that there's indian style designs on the wall that jack is throwing a tennis ball at uh when he's stuck in the pantry there's calame powder that has an indian face on the can there are indian style rugs everywhere i mean it was built on an indian burial ground and i think that the at the very least the production designers realized that okay so there's some in native american history here so we're going to you know make the hotel right. have that kind it, of well, well yeah job. and it's modeled it's modeled after the famous hotel in what yosemite is it the, i can't remember the name of the hotel but so it's modeled it's the after the stanley that, hotel was, in colorado or at least that's that's where that's the original hotel that stephen king stayed at that inspired the book I don't know right. if that's the same uh, yeah, thing no, no, that Austin's it, talking it, it, about. No, no, it's 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 in like Yosemite. Um, I can't remember the name of the hotel. I can get it in one second here, actually. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think there was also a hotel in California that inspired some of the look to it as well. Oh, oh yeah. On, two seconds here. And then the exteriors were based on this hotel in Montana. So the hotel is called the Awanahi Hotel in Yosemite National Park. My parents have actually stayed there. And then, yeah, the Stanley Hotel in Colorado is for the exteriors. But the interiors, uh, which this is a hotel in Yosemite that actually has a lot of Native American art and patterns and things like that. So that doesn't surprise me if he's not trying to make some grand statement about Native American genocide. Do you think that's just trying to emulate the hotel? Do you think that the fact that the image at the end of the movie is the July 4th ball, you know, like the celebration of American independence, does that add to the credence of this theory at all? I mean, it it could. I, I think that ultimately someone's trying to force a specificity about something that is far more likely to be just about aggression and violence within human psyche itself, because we already know that he's he's a reader of Freud and that he's interested in psychoanalysis. We talked about that in the Eyes Wide Shut episode. I mean, that's that's not something that in any way I think we would deny. I mean, he's very clear about that even in interviews that he was influenced by psychoanalysis. He read a lot of Freud. So for me, the Freudian psychoanalytic, uh, the labyrinthine themes are far more striking than these like, oh, it's a commentary on this or a commentary on that. It could be because he obviously wrote Full Metal Jacket, which is a commentary on American imperialism in a lot of ways. So it could have some of these other themes that are more, let's say, political. But I think the psychoanalytic readings are far more interesting. Yeah, my, my take on all that is that you're right, that Stanley Kubrick is way more into the whole psychoanalytical aspect of the of the story. But all of these symbolisms is from Stephen King. Because Stephen King just, that's what he does. He messes with, you know, big iconography you know elements in his stories and then mixes them all together and so yeah he's like okay yeah a guy in a native american hotel and like he just mixed all these things up i think that's as basically as deep as it goes with i why well, from I, what i remember that the book is very different from the movie. exactly yeah, yeah. right yeah. they go yeah. way into that way they added more. a lot of this stuff right and so steven they uh, added think, a lot more in the movie than they had in the book is what i'm saying as far as like the indian uh symbolism and stuff that wasn't necessarily in the book and and Steve, uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick, at least, like, he's just trying to make a scary movie, I think, at the end of the day. 
<laughs> sure. <You> think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he's really not putting all that stuff. All but right. I do think he's super detailed and made – I do think he put a lot of uh, – what do you call it? Like um, – what's it called when something is – when you split a circle in half, uh, symmetrical. <laughs> he put a lot of symmetrical stuff in the movie because if you remember at Fantastic Fest, they literally played sh The Shining over itself. Like they were, they had it one way superimposed uh, going forward, and then they had it going backwards over itself the, I've for heard two that. out. And and it was scary how much it synced up, you know. And so there's all these people yeah. I think that go into that that you know have, kind of have OCD. I'd like, like to see that again. I would yeah. like to hate watch Room Two Three Seven again. You should. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the thing with with Room Two Three Seven is we're not supposed to take it too seriously and people who do take it too seriously are obviously looking for something they're they're grasping for something i think that it's 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 like a cultural artifact that's interesting because it muses on potential like i don't know intertextual references or something yeah. like that which i think is a fascinating thought experiment but i'm not sure we need to invest ourselves in these conspiracy theories or these other like textual resonances that just seems a little too i don't over enthusiastic and try hard yeah. I mean, to me, the best thing about this movie is definitely uh, the filmmaking technique. I think that it's probably one of the, the you can see how he very deliberately constructs shots and kind of gives us this ambiguous conclusion as to what exactly is happening in the hotel. But before what we do get you to things going on in the film. Well, I want to I want to just do one more reading that I found interesting okay. before we go into that question of what exactly is happening in the hotel. Um, so this time watching the movie, I noticed something that I don't know how relevant it is. I'm, I'm curious to what you guys think, but they talk about there, there's this awareness of television and media and horror films in this movie. So uh, yeah. early on when Jack is being interviewed for the job, he says, my wife, Wendy, is a ghost story and horror film addict. And then uh, later when they're driving up. Uh, he Jack is reacting to the fact that Danny somehow knows what the Donner Party is, and he says, see, it's okay. He saw it on the television. There are mm -hmm. some shots where there's the television is at the center of the frame. There's a shot where Danny is watching Roadrunner, and he's, like, transfixed. And then I think you could make a really good argument that as Jack gets crazier, he talks more and more like a TV character. Of course, there's Wendy, I'm home, and, of course, here's Johnny. Uh... <laughs> Not by the hair on your chinny chin chin, then I'll huff and I'll puff. Um, and, you know, when you think about this movie, this movie came out in 1980, and I think that there was a big horror film boon that kind of led up to this. So mm -hmm. I guess my question for you guys is do you think that there is uh, almost, there, there is a reactionary element to this movie that the movie's kind of reacting to the popular horror cinema that preceded it, that probably even allowed this movie to get made because horror cinema was so effective and successful and it even is today it's true halloween was what three years before this uh i've actually not seen halloween no i mean i think you're right that it was riding a wave that we're not really we haven't talked about yet it's, it's true and then um, yeah, i want to say halloween was 78 so yeah between that and then the quick follow-ups of like friday the 13th and those kind of things i mean slashers were in vogue and this one it's kind of is the slasher like the way that wendy's holding her knife and everything but really once we break out the axe then it becomes that even though with all the shit going on in this movie there's what one guy that dies mr halloran dies and then jack that's right that's a good point i think that there are some it, it definitely inverts a lot of these horror tropes that those slasher movies relied on so for example like the axe through the door scene i mean most if this were a slasher in the tradition of the films that built up to this, it would build suspense until Wendy kind of goes in the bathroom, then she would relax until she feels safe and the audience feels safe, and then suddenly, without warning, the axe would come crashing through the door and the audience would jump, like a jump scare. That's what happens in slasher films. But with this one, we know where Jack is. We know that he's approaching the door. We know he's about to, you know, so instead of having us be scared with Wendy... I mean, we are scared with Wendy, but for different reasons. Like, it definitely, um, instead of having Jack be like Jason or Freddy Krueger, who are these mysterious characters that were never with their perspective, he definitely tries something a bit more radical and shows us from the beginning we are with the perspective of the person who becomes the monster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this film, remember how I was a little bit 
turned off by Hereditary's turn at the end of the film because I thought it, it it sort of rationalized what was otherwise I thought a nice mystery and tension building exploration of you know psychological depths and uh, trauma and things like that within the human the human experience. This film doesn't do that, and so that's why this film is far more interesting because one, it's not like oh here's a monster that's coming to get you like the slasher films are, and then it's also not here's some sort of spiritual occultish thing that rationalizes everything. You're still left at the end kind of like, what the fuck is going on? Even there's all, there's all that talk about The Shining and there are these people that are able to tap into the future and the past and that the building itself, that the hotel itself sort of has this shining resonant possibility as well. All of that is still very unexplained and I really like that because I like yeah. confusion because it stimulates thought. The, and it, it the, keeps you on the edge of your toes. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, Mike. I think the scariest monsters are the ones that we know, the monster you know, and so much of this movie is about family and family relationships, and that the father, that Jack is the monster, that Charles slash Delbert Grady is a monster. I mean, this so much of this is about just those horrible moments of family and the tension that happens and that we have this history of abuse from Jack to Danny and then the way that Jack treats Wendy I mean, those are the scenes that make your skin crawl. Like when she comes in and he just lays into her verbally abusing her, that's like almost as bad as a knife point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because the real monsters are projections of the worst parts of humanity, right? Or the things that humans are scared of or the things that humans are trying to reconcile with. And this film is all about the monster that's inside of you the monster that's inside your brain. And so that's why even though Room 237 has those weird conspiracy ones, the one that I find the most interesting is probably the one where they say that it's about the Minotaur because the idea of the labyrinth and the maze and the Minotaur seems to be something that Kubrick was very intentionally employing as a motif. I mean, I yeah, the, but but the Minotaur the design, thing, like the, the, sorry, I mean, there's a maze, but as far as it being <laughs> like Minotaur, Theseus, like I just don't buy it. Like, yes, there is a maze. I think you could make a good argument that it's the maze-like structure of the brain but i i just the, the i remember this part in 237 i think this is where i lost my shit where they're like focusing on this poster that is very clearly a poster showing a guy skiing and they're like oh but if you look at it the shadow makes yeah, it look like a minotaur i was like yeah. no, I, I wanted like to get up part. and fucking leave <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 no that's i mean they're obviously forcing so let's say that again even when we watch room 237 we don't take them literally maybe they want to be taken literally but at least what they're noticing is this theme of the minotaur which i think is fascinating because even if a boring representation of the Minotaur story would be a literal, here's a story of a Minotaur and Theseus who goes in and it's Ariadne and all of these characters. That's the boring, okay, great, we get it, representational art, blah, 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 blah. This is 2018, let's be interesting. Or if I, this is 1980, let's be interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, even still, right? Even still, like representational art has existed for centuries, so we don't need to reproduce something that's a few millennia old. So the interesting way to look at it is just to take a motif and to insert it into this larger thing set of thematics where it's about human psychology, it's about family, it's about trauma, it's about male fragility and resentment because uh, his wife is just this sperm bank that's not given him the satisfaction that he desires, which is why he has that weird uh, interaction with the woman in 237 at that one point, right? It's about people um, in bear so costumes these... blowing guys. Yeah, he the look on it, his it, face when he sees that woman in 237, like, you know, there is not even a seconds of thought of like, oh, you know, but I, maybe I shouldn't cheat on my wife. Like, he's just like in it. No. Like, he's just like, I am ready to submit myself to fantasy. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I think when you look at the idea of Theseus and Minotaur as being maybe Danny and Jack uh, at the end, that we don't need to... to, to to expect that it would be such a literal rendition, but that it has these nice thematic motifs that are a part of it. And I think that's interesting. Yeah. So just to, to, to cap off my my rant on Room 237, <laughs> I would say that the movie would be more interesting if these people said one could interpret this as a minotaur, but they don't say that. They say it's a minotaur, and then I ask myself, who the fuck is this guy <laughs> saying this? Like It's like some sort of authoritative statement. 
and then I don't get the answer to that question, and I'm like, this this but, but, documentary but, is not asking the right question. But the structure right of the movie, though, is literally you just hear a new guy's voice every yeah. 10 minutes, right. you know, a new theory. Didn't you just get the idea, like, okay, this is this guy's opinion, so it's it, I didn't get the authoritative aspect of the movie, because they don't structure like that. It's not like a History Channel documentary on The Shining. How is you it know? not? Like, it's it's it, not, because it's just literally just like... Here's room 237, and then here's one crazy person talking about a crazy theory, and then another. But that whole crazy, and you're projecting that. I like, am projecting it, there, but I think if, Austin If there was an earlier, authoritative voice that, like, you know, like that painted these people as crazy, then at least there would be a, a sense of perspective. But they don't, they did they that on purpose, that. though. They did it, they said, we're going to let the audience come up with whatever they can come up, <laughs> and you obviously are like, fuck these people, they're bullshitting us, and I'm like, man, I, I want to know what these people are like, too, but I'm glad that I only all got I, their five-minute right, take I, on I the show. All right, all right, I want to move on, but the last thing I'll say is all I wanted was to see these people's faces. I wanted to see who they are, <laughs> what their day it's jobs cooler are. cooler that you don't. I, it's cool. You so only you can get the judge theory. them because they're dressed weird. Jared? Exactly. Is that what it is? And Maybe. then delegitimate them based on the funky hat. Exactly. That the guy I don't need is to wearing. see them to delegitimize them. What they're saying is absurd. And so that's, that's what's that, cool. That, you're, that basing it, you're basing it solely on what they said. All right. Right. But if they were wearing a suit and they said, uh, "My name is Doctor So and So from the psychology no, department absolutely. and film department," then then I would no. No. Then I would be scared to death for our universities. Thirteen-year-old <laughs> <laughs> kids. Uh, all right. So, guys, before we move on, I want to give a shout-out to our sponsors over at Nordic Track. So, Nordic Track, it is workout equipment. Sometimes it's hard to find time to go to the gym. I would know because I find it hard to find time to go to the gym. We've all got a busy schedule. Waking up early in the morning really sucks. If you're in a big city like me, going and finding parking at a gym after just getting up is just really the hard worst. to motivate yourself. Yeah, it's really hard to motivate yourself. Plus, and you got to pay like 20 bucks for it or something like that. Yeah, and getting a trainer is especially super time consuming and costly. Yeah. So with Nordic Track, basically the gym comes to you. Uh, it's got a series of training equipment that can give you an amazing workout in the convenience of your home own home. So I'm talking treadmills, exercise bikes, incline trainers, strength trainers. Um, you can even join streamed workouts at any time of the day. So you don't need a trainer because you could just hop on your computer, hop on your phone and get a workout and go along with these people and you don't even have to feel like you're doing it alone. Um, so you can uh, join these workouts in the streets of Paris or in the shores of Thailand or work out in the African safari. They give you uh, tons of options. One thing I like is I like that they have um, a treadmill that doubles as a standing desk because I sit way too much, and if you can get a workout in and get work done, then you're pretty much killing it. So... Um, <laughs> They're offering Wisecrack listeners 75 bucks off your Nordic Track purchase. So you guys got to visit nordictrack.com slash show me and using the offer code show me. Again, that's nordictrack.com slash show me. Use the offer code show me during checkout to get 75 bucks off your purchase. All right, guys, back to the show. All right, so now let's just open the question. What Do you guys have any definitive ideas or thoughts as to what is going on in the hotel? I already we already heard what Austin said. Mike. Oh man, put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I, you guys were talking about the idea of the uh, the half a circle before, and I love the idea of all the doubling of stuff that's going on in here. The idea of uh, Danny having Tony, his imaginary friend, and then Jack having is it Delbert at this point, Grady as his imaginary friend and just the way that we uh, have these mirrors and so much of this movie and the original ending of this movie was kind of that cycle of violence that I was talking about earlier with abuse and that the tennis ball that Jack has is, you know, rolling towards Danny in the hallway. And then at the very end of the film, we see him bouncing the ball against a wall, just like his father was. Now that's, you know, obviously cut out, but then we also talk about cycles as well, as far as you've always been the caretaker, you know, this is, mm. you know, mm. maybe Delbert Grady is a different person than Charles Grady. You know, maybe there's a, uh, like an imaginary version of him. And this is, you know, this whole idea of all of these things have happened before and they will continue happening until the end of time. So that's why every night in the gold room, we're going to have this party going on and it's just going to repeat mm. itself. So, I mean, there's, those kind of things are what I enjoy about this movie is that it, 
opens up so many different avenues that you can pursue and say, oh, look at this. You know, there's doublings of the maze outside and then the maze of the actual overlook itself. There's doublings of, you know, this design versus this design. So it's really nice to take those pieces and try to fit them together. And this is such a nice puzzle that you can put it together in different orientations. It's not always, you know, put in, in most puzzles, you can only fit the pieces one way in this, they interlock in many different ways. Hmm. Cool. Ryan. I mean, I mean like, you know, do you, when you, you've seen the movie a bunch of times, yeah. if somebody asks you like, Hey man, what is the shining about? Or like, you know, what happens? Like explain the movie to me. What would you say? Well, I mean, to me, the, I guess if I was going to rep, what does the hotel represent? It's isolation is kind of the best word I'd say. Mm -hmm. A guy, it, it, like the whole movie is, about, you know, it's it's a fucking big ass mansion. It'd be a different choice if he ha it was just in a little shack, you know, right? It wouldn't be. I don't know. Yeah, if it was the Bates <laughs> Motel, it'd be a lot that's different all than I got, the really. Motel. The movie's yeah. about isolation <laughs> and going crazy. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think that I think that I, I think those are both really interesting ways of looking at it, and I don't. I don't disagree with either of them. I actually think they get enfolded into the way that I think the most interesting way to read it is. But I think it's a it's a film about the commentary on the human psyche. I know I said this before, but I think that in a way you could say that the hotel is sort of um, a visual representation or a visual metaphor for human the, the human psyche itself. And so this idea of repetition, like Mike was just talking about, is the idea of the repetitions of the violence and the traumas that are embedded within the human psyche and that it's related to murder and death, which is very Freudian, this idea of the, the killing of the primal father, which you obviously have these tensions with the father and the son and, um, and the kind of denial of death and red rum and these like seas of, of blood that are kind of flowing. And so I think that that death and murder and trauma are essential at this hotel. And then, of course, you see all the skeletons and the cobwebs. So there's all these themes that seem to imply long periods of time, death, uh, kind of uh, traumatic elements, skeletons in the closet. And I think that, that those are really kind of quite striking to me. And I think that, that, that that's why I say the most interesting way to read the film is through the lens of like a Freudian psychoanalytic reading about the human unconscious itself, and that Jack and Danny and Wendy are just sort of, you know, they're just um, they're just singularities that repeat within this same cycle of violence. Yeah, I really one like that. that I really, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Mike. One one of the things that I really enjoy about the movie is just looking at, you know, we were talking about perspectives before, and the the use of the steady cam in this movie is so fantastic that it gives you this yes. free floating perspective. And sometimes it feels like it's the hotel itself. Other times it feels like you're looking through a character's POV. There's mm. one point, I think, when he's going into the room to see the beautiful woman slash hag. Again, another nice doubling. And he opens up the door and you see his hand push it open. So it's very much like Jack's POV and the way that she's mm. framed in there, almost like a proscenium. And then he walks into it. So it, it can't be his POV or it, maybe it's his POV for a little bit, but then the camera stays outside and he moves into it from the left-hand side. So it really throws you off as far as, I thought this was a POV shot. Now suddenly it's an impassive camera shot. So Maybe it's our POV. Right, right? exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think what Mike is touching on is is exactly what I was going to go into. Actually, this is the subject of our, uh, our film tourist episode that's coming out next month. It's all about how Kubrick plays with perspective to basically, and I would say maybe this is a cop out. I mean, I'd say he basically is just fucking with us. That's that's yeah. that's my whole theory on the movie too. He he's is just an yeah. OCD person who is playing with other OCD people. <laughs> so the the same <laughs> well, thing. Well, it's that... like he does that bit with the with the mirror shot with when Jack is sleeping the first time that he wakes up in the hotel, and you think that the shot is on him, but as it pulls out, it starts to turn out that that's actually just his reflection, and then the whole scene plays out in the reflection. Um, except for Wendy when she first walks in. She walks in in the shot, and then she goes into the reflection. And so that that kind of reverses the angle, and it kind of – it's jarring. It's sort of like, you know, uh, when when directors fuck with the 180-degree rule, right? It's it's doing something like that where it jars the audience, so you're like, wait a second. What am I looking at? So there's How many mirrors are in this movie? I mean, it's crazy so many. how many mirrors. And then even when he first sees Lloyd and he's looking at – 
himself basically and then we get that head-on shot from him and he puts Mm. his hands over his eyes and then he pulls it down and then he starts to talk to us but then it's actually now again Mm. lloyd's pov so it's like whoa just he is really pulling the rug out from under you yeah so i was going to talk about that shot so we see we think we're seeing lloyd from his perspective and so the conclusion that we could draw from that is, okay, if we're seeing this from Jack's perspective, then we can assume that this is all some sort of subjective delusion and that he's losing his mind. But just when we're about to think that, the shot, the camera goes back and it reveals Jack Torrance's like shoulder. It becomes a close-up to a over-the-shoulder shot as if to give it more objectivity. It fucks with you. It says, like, oh, you think this is subjective? Nope. It's objective, like it's really happening. And this happens constantly. And the the, the steady cam thing that Mike brought up, uh, and this was the first use of the steady cam, right? It was crazy. No, it had been used before. He did it in passive glory was... too, right? Through the barracks? Yeah. Yeah, that was through with Dolly's, but oh, he okay. uh, steady can. Garrett Brown had done stuff with uh, what was it? Uh, Bound for Glory, uh, the one about um, uh, with David Carradine. Woody Guthrie. Yeah, Woody Guthrie, and then also the obviously the famous step sequence in Rocky, and then also a lot of work on Exorcist too, and kind of also the pulling hmm. the uh, POV of the demon Pazuzu in that film. Interesting. Hmm. Awesome. See, you got to check out this guy's podcast. He knows his shit. Um, <laughs> Speaking of, uh, I, I have one of those weird shots for yeah. you. Or uh, uh, Who lets him out of the freezer? Exactly. <laughs> this is when it's not even just like perspective, but the, the, the physical laws are thrown out the window yeah. because like, okay, if Grady is an apparition, how can he affect physical reality? Exactly. And somehow he's let out of the freezer. And what's your answer to that, well, Jared? Show me the meaning. It's a joke. It, it's <laughs> not a joke. It's it's, t- well, it's it Cooper just be. fucking with us. You know, All like right. the yeah. idea. The, the, the idea that there is like, it, it, yeah, he's scaring us by thwarting our efforts to impose meaning or some sort of concrete logic to the film or the hotel. It's a big troll. It's a big troll. He's I have a fucking a... troll. He's a minotaur troll. <laughs> I have a room 237 level reading of that, which is that we've got, uh, it's almost like a, a monkey's paw where you get the three wishes. He he says he sell his soul for a drink. He gets a drink. He just talking about the old sperm bag, up, sperm bag upstairs. He ends up getting that beautiful woman who ends up being a hag. And then he's trapped in the freezer and he ends up getting out. So we've got the three wishes, which none of them really work out in anybody's favor. Holy shit, let's make two thirty set room two thirty seven two. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, it could, no, be, I, it I could think... be two it could be two that Danny let him out. True. Right? Um it yeah. could be like like what happened to Danny's neck earlier. That's true. We don't really know, right? Maybe Jack really did do that to him. And so there's this idea that somehow they're conspiring against one another because they sort of need each other in this traumatic struggle of trauma and violence that gets repeated within the human psyche. And so all of these these needs for like did this objectively happen or was this subjective are sort of collapsed into the idea that everything is a psychological subjective objectivity. So it's both. It's subjective and objective because it's subjectively in the psyche. If that makes sense. Yeah, the way that they set up that uh, that whole thing with him, uh, Jack and Danny, and he's like, oh, I want to stay here forever and forever. And so like <laughs> doubling the, the, the words of the twins or the oh, yeah. even though they're not supposed to be twins. Um, and then that goes into Danny going into the room. So we never really see the assault, but then it's weird that it cuts before he actually can get into room 237 and see, like, because, again, it's like mirrors galore inside of that room. And then, like, cut now to him wandering into the room. So it's almost like that entry into room 237 is the fantasy while he's being, you know, choked by Jack. I mean, that's one way to read it. Mm. Yeah, so I wanted to go back to what Mike just said about uh, the monkey's paw. And I was kind of interpreting some of the things going on as uh, kind of like a once again Kubrick fucking with us by kind of hinting at like a Faustian kind of thing so he says I'd sell my soul for a goddamn beer and then Lloyd immediately shows Mm -hmm. up so we're meant to believe and then later when he's freaking out at Wendy because yeah when he's freaking out at Wendy he says when she says they should leave but he says I signed a contract similar to yes Faust signing a contract uh, with the devil in blood 
Um, and then maybe this one, Jack says, I'm the kind of man who likes to know who's buying his drinks, Lloyd. And Lloyd's like, that mm. doesn't concern you. Is he? Is it the devil, a demon? I don't know. Once again, these are just more things that I think Kubrick is just like, maybe it's the devil. Maybe it's not. Ultimately, it doesn't make sense. Well, and really, and it's Stephen King. Too remember because he it's it's Kubrick playing with Stephen King's kind, kind of and I, I think mean, Stephen because, King does the same thing things... he trolls people too and with with I haven't read the book but I will say that the things that uh, Kubrick is accomplishing here and thwarting our perspective or our ability to make sense of this is largely done formally through the medium of film like in ways yeah. that ways that Stephen King couldn't do through text and he hated the movie too. Yeah, I'm. Sh I wonder how what he thinks about it now. He doesn't like it. He still doesn't like it. Yeah. Oh, he still hates it. Yeah, he okay. thought that that TV version was like the definitive version. I tried. Well, one of the things that. he didn't like about it. Oh, that it's a rough watch. Yeah. One of the things that he hated about the original was the idea of Jack Nicholson playing Jack Torrance, and he's just like, well, he starts crazy, and there's no place to go from there. You know, like because I think because Nicholson now had baggage from. Uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest in some of those earlier roles that King just couldn't buy him in that place. And plus, you know, I mean, it's basically supposed to be a stand-in for Stephen King, right? And kind of like a wish fulfillment version of him with the hot blonde and all this kind of stuff. So I think that was an affront to him, the casting of Nicholson and the casting of Shelley Duvall. Yeah, I, I was thinking, of, I'd heard that, and I was thinking about this last night, and, and as much as I love Jack Nicholson, and as incredible as he is in this movie, I was thinking it would be such a different experience if it was a guy who was just, who seems like more of your average Joe, and then by the end becomes more Jack Nicholson manic, but I mean, I guess you're right, whenever I think of Jack Nicholson, I think of the Joker, Easy Rider, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, he's always a little bit on the crazy side. You want a Jason Bateman. So do you think, do you think then that the Stephen King novel is more more about what Ryan was saying that it's more about isolation and the the pitfalls of being a writer who needs to sit there and you get lost in your own imagination and kind of the descent into madness that takes place is that do you think more in the novel than maybe in the film and that's why King didn't like it I haven't read the novel I also think that alcohol plays more of a a a part in the novel than it does in the film. I mean, yeah, there's a whole thing of him not drinking and that does play kind of a theme in the movie, but it's nowhere near like we don't necessarily say the demon is alcohol. You know, we think about the overlook and the overlook is the demon, but if we can kind of break it, break through that and say, no, the real demon is alcohol, but I don't think we would ever get there with this film. I don't think we would ever say, no, the true bad guy of this is that he's taking a drink. Oh, yeah. but Stephen King was trying to focus on that more in the book? Well, that was, again, a personal thing for him because he was uh, um. quite a drinker uh, for a time. And then eventually he would get hooked on pain pills after he got hit by a car. So he's always had substance abuse problems. So I think that I mean, that here's was... the thing. I don't want to sound like a dick, but that's just far more boring than what Kubrick put together here. Yeah. I, to, yeah no. Again, to try to try to be like, here's the problem. This is the demon. That 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 to me, again, is, is my problem with hereditary. It's it's too literal, man. Like, this is fucking art. Let's have some poetic openness here and i yeah, think that, answers are for posers yeah. man it's questions is where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> questions Amen, bro brother. questions that's why i'm a philosopher um so i want to talk about jack uh this time when i watched it i really kind of focused on and there are some really amazing things about jack nicholson's performance one of the things is um there is i i i what i really appreciated this time is how the hotel kind of gives in to it, it not only represents his frustrations but also represents and ultimately kind of gives him a little bit of his fantasy so um there are a couple times in the beginning so first of all we hear uh actually this is later in the movie he says that he works at a car wash and shovels driveways and how wendy fucked up his life um i really like this moment did this guys did this strike you guys so the apartment that they're given they keep on using these like kind of passive aggressive language like looking at it like it's cozy and homey like, are they, like, do they feel like, oh, man, like, this big hotel and you're giving us this shit room? Like, is is there any indication of that? Did you guys get that at all? I remember the moments mm. you're talking about, but, yeah, I didn't get that from that. There's also, um, when Jack is getting the tour, the tour guide tells him that all the people that stay at the hotel are all the best people. Um, and then mm. when he's there at the party scene, 
um, in like the 1920s. Like he's around these like what I would imagine are like these 1920s aristocrats. And he's so performative when he's talking to Lloyd. He's having this great time. He's usually right. dancing through the hallways as if he believes this is where I belong among. Yeah, there's a lovely class element in this film yeah. that I, I would love to do like a just a singular Marxist reading of this film because it clearly is playing with the idea of the working class versus the like bourgeois, right? And maybe the idea of the hominess of the room is feeding into that resentment right. that Jack already elicits with he can't really hold down a job. He's kind of out of work. He used to teach just to make ends meet, but he wasn't proud of it. He didn't love it. It wasn't like a passion. It was something that he did just to get by, but really he's a struggling writer, and so he doesn't have the thing that he wants. He doesn't have the fulfillment of his desire, so he's not content. So there is an interesting class element that Kubrick is exploring here too. Um, and going back to the second ago, you, you talk you praising Jack Nicholson's performance. If you uh, uh, there's some funny insight into that. If you watch uh, Stanley Kubrick's daughter's uh, uh, like short documentary about the making of The Shining, called The Making of The Shining, I think uh, everyone should go watch it. And you see Jack Nicholson in the back because this was like a crazy over uh, delayed shoot that went on and on and on, and they kind of were like you know art became reality because they were kind of all going crazy in the hotel. <laughs> and you see Jack Nicholson just sitting there like being like, I get a new script every day and it just, <laughs> I get to the set and it's a different script. So I just throw the things away in the morning. I just don't even get, read them anymore. You know, and he's <laughs> just sitting there and then he's just like pumping himself up with an ax. Like you can tell he's just kind of like, I guess we're making some weird, scary movie and I'm going to go act crazy. And then Stanley Kubrick edited it together into this weird masterpiece. So, Well, I heard something that I think is in that documentary, Ryan. You can tell me that the, the little boy, Danny, I don't remember what the actor's name is, but it's Danny Danny something. Lloyd. Danny Lloyd, that he didn't know that he was in a horror film. That no, he thought he was just that. in like a hotel family drama, which when I watched the film, I'm like, but he's holding a knife and he's getting scared by these ghosts. How did he get that performance out of him if it wasn't a horror film? But what is that covered at all? I don't believe so. I mean, he's in the he's in the that thing. Seems but like more really IMDb trivia. Yeah. No, I've seen Danny Lloyd in person, and that's exactly what he had to say. Oh, that's amazing! Right? Whoa, oh, cool. Well, there we go. <laughs> Shit, man. How the fuck? How? Like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, he's so young. That kid's awesome. I think we should. Oh, he's so good. We should also think. Is... Me... Oh, sorry. Go. Go ahead. No, 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 yeah. I was just going to say we should take a moment to give a hand for Shelley Duvall in this movie. I mean, shit. Yeah. Wow. Good job, Shelley. You know, I have a question. I was watching this, and I was thinking to myself, is there something important that Danny, the actor's character's name is Danny, that Jack, the actor's name is Jack, but that Shelley, the actor's name is not Shelley? Is there something important about that that huh. is supposed to focus our attention on her character as Winifred? Room 237 or... too. I don't know. I mean, is the names in the book, are they consistent? Oh. I, don't, I don't know. I think they are. I yeah, think they are. then I probably wouldn't uh, think too much into it. Anyway. Oh, well, but yeah, no, that's a mind. good point. And plus, they, <laughs> the, the Halloran asks her two other names. He's like, are you a Winnie? Or are you, like, like I can't remember what the yeah, other one is. And then she says, no, no, I'm a, I'm a Wendy. It's like, oh, okay. Mm. I think that could probably speak to more what Austin was talking about earlier with, like, you know, her just being the whatever, like his cum bucket or whatever. What is the word? He's sperm's receptacle. Sperm, sperm, bank. sperm bank. Sperm bank. My yeah. bad. <laughs> cum bucket. <laughs> what yeah. is the difference? I mean, there, 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 well, what there is, is the something difference? really interesting. Like, again, because <laughs> there are all these different readings. Like, so, like, uh, a class analysis reading would be interesting. A feminist reading would be interesting. A psychoanalytic reading. A mythical reading. I mean, there are all these different ways to look at this film. And I think this is what's so interesting about him as a filmmaker. Is he's able to encapsulate all of these motifs into a story that's also gripping. Where I think so just... many people, they try to be conceptual and they lose out on interesting narrative or interesting story. And he's able to consistently do that. And can you just imagine that. him reading all those meanings and just cracking his up, cracking right. up, <laughs> being like, ha, 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 yeah, I get what these people yeah, think this movie's just... about. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a really nice uh, YouTube video out there. The guy was not in room 237. His name's Rob Ager, I think it is. And he does this whole reading about the gold room and 
how America was switching over from the gold standard at that time. So when Lloyd uh, says your money's not good here anymore, it's or your money's uh, no good here. It's like, well, because that's like post gold standard. And it was actually really interesting. And plus like uh, they talked about like the best people were here. And then he tries to figure out who some of those people are in the photo at the end. And it was like, well, this person looks like it was Woodrow Wilson's sister. And this is like, you know, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt's niece or whatever. And it's just like, Okay, yeah, it gets real deep real quick, but he actually makes some good points. See, this is what Room 237 should have answered but didn't, and it is why are people drawn to this film in particular and try and project meaning onto it? I think they yeah, why kind of I used to... I mean, of, of Kubrick's films, I think The Shining is probably this, or maybe like 2001 are the ones that people talk about the most. Not Dude, that on, they like on, the most on YouTube, people are crazy about The Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, conspiracies. Oh, yeah. The Illuminati thing. The Illuminati thing, thing. Yeah. yeah. Are they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. th- I used to hate Room 237 until I talked to the filmmaker and I was just like, I didn't say like, why did you leave all the stupid stuff, like the kid coming in and interrupting the guy, but I was just like, you know, kind of talked to that point and it was like, well, you know, this, The Shining's really about family and I wanted to make sure that we got the families in there and stuff and I was like, after talking to, what is it, Rodney Asher, I think, made the film, I was just like, okay, I respect this film a little bit more. Hmm. To me, it's more of a, a movie about people who need better things to do. Yes. But yeah, there's like a need <laughs> to look for deeper meaning. Because there's a lot of shit where they're just like, oh, yeah, and if you look here, it looks like a like he's got a big heart on and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whoa, what are you talking about? Like, that's a desk. What are you saying that because the guy moves around the desk, he's got a big heart on for Jack? I'm like, that's that's bizarre. Yeah, Ryan, it would be like watching the King of Kong, but it only being Donkey Kong footage. No, it is not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is. It. All right, all right. Let's move on to the mailbag. So we got uh, some emails regarding Star Wars. So if you guys haven't heard our rant on the Star Wars backlash, uh, I don't think it's up on our uh, Wise Cast channel yet, It's, uh, but it is on the RSS feed, so definitely go check that out. All right. So this one is from Justin. He says, while listening to the last episode of Show Me the Meaning, I got a little irked by the discussion of Admiral Holdo. This isn't really on you guys, but a lot of people complain about how she made a mistake by not telling Poe the plan. But this smells like utter bullshit. She doesn't tell him the plan because not only does he not need to know and is on a far lower link in the chain of command, but also because it's a little bit, fuck you, flyboy. She is the admiral and he needs to follow orders. The only reason the plan fails is because Poe sends Rose and Finn who get betrayed by JD. The character Holdo is a little thin, but a strong one. If Michael Ironside or Clancy Brown played Holdo, I don't think we'd be hearing all this hate. How dare that shrill, bossy woman do her job? <laughs> so uh, I, I get this, like, and that's, and, and I'm, I'm glad that he wrote this in um, because I think that that is how we're supposed to read it. That that Holdo, you know, like, yeah, like we're supposed to say if he had just followed orders and everything would be okay. What do you guys think? I mean, because because I, I disagree. I mean, uh, I, I well, no, I, I agree that that we're supposed to take it that way. But yeah. I think that the logic of the plan is so poorly, like, drawn out to the audience or p- portrayed to the audience that it seems like bad leadership, no matter right. her gender. You know, like it just right. seems like, wait, what? Why'd you have to keep that for everybody? It, you know, and, it, and, and shouldn't it, she know that like there may be like dissent breeding among her ranks? Right. Like you can't just ignore that and just say, well, it ought to be this way. Yeah, exactly. So I get their point, but I disagree. I think that it was a poorly laid out plan. Uh, Austin, anything on that? I don't care. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really our, don't. I mean, I, it, it wasn't our point. Our point so wasn't so much the that she was a bad leader or something like that that she all she had to do was just kind of explain to Poe yo dude get in line I got this secret bigger master stroke the biggest issue with Holdo was uh, was what kind of what what the writer who was the that wrote the email uh this is from Justin that Justin said uh about you know that oh if this were you know, a dude in this role, then we would have just kind of like taken it so seriously. How dare, how dare this like strong woman? But wasn't that kind of the point is that, is that the backlash against the film was kind of, um, in that sort of like supposedly anti woman sentiment and that the backlash to the backlash was, wait a second, how dare you 
not just trust women. So then it's like the I trust woman thing. So isn't that more what we concentrated on than about like the foolishness of the plan? I, I don't know. I don't know either. Anyway, moving on. Um, yeah. So this next one is from Matt. He said, one big question I had about your discussion. You argue that Ryan Johnson is more of an art house director in the fashion of Paul Thomas Anderson. If that's true, do you think, putting aside questions of Star Wars canon and diversity, that The Last Jedi works as a film? My opinion is that it does not. The pacing is boring, the tone is all over the place, and some of the promising characters from The Force Awakens are left in boring, pointless side plots. Um, so, yeah, I, I want to clarify here. I don't think that Ryan Johnson is an art house director. I guess what I mean by that is... Yeah, he's more concerned with making a piece of art that cinematic director. Yeah, some, yeah, something more cinematic than something that, uh, you know, has a deep, compelling world with uh, lore and plot and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and I think that he's bringing something up. Like, if he were able, if he achieved that, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's a totally different thing. It's like this is what he was going for, or this is how he fancies himself, and this is what he's actually able to achieve. And I would agree. I think that. If the movie worked on the cinematic level that it was aspiring to, then, yeah, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. Agreed. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's it from us today. If you guys want to chime in with any of the discussion, you want to give us some thoughts on The Shining, hit us up at movies at wisecrack.com. I want to give a shout out to Mike White. Thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Thank you so much, guys, for letting me be part of this discussion. I appreciate it. Yeah, where can, where can people find you? Tell us about your podcast. I'm over at uh, projection-booth.com, and yeah, every week we put out a new episode, or sometimes two, which is really stupid, but that's what I do. <laughs> and so, and uh, tell us- I've been doing it for about seven years. So I mentioned this earlier, but I'm on his podcast on The Piano Teacher, which is an extremely deranged Michael Haneke film. <laughs> um, and when is that coming out, Mike? Uh, that should drop August 3rd. August 3rd. I'll be looking Sweet. forward to that. Uh, and where can we find everyone else on the internet? Ryan. Um, Ryan's Game Show and Ryan's Shorts on YouTube and Facebook. I'm coming out with a movie, I mean a short on Ryan's Soda Reviews, and then also a life hack on how to fly. Cool. And Austin. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter, Austin underscore Hayden. I do a philosophy podcast called Owl's at dawn and then i also actually do another movie podcast that i never talk about because i'm terrible with promoting myself but it's called i dig this movie and it's with a buddy of mine who's an award-winning director in london named keir seward and he's got like an encyclopedic knowledge of film and i'm just the douchey philosopher so we talk about <laughs> movies that we love cool cool uh hit me up on twitter at wisecrack hit me up on instagram at father of woody for the best dog pics in the biz uh, also, want to just remind you guys, uh, if you want to take place in our polls, if you want to be part of the conversation of what we cover, hit us up at wisecrackplus.com. Consider joining. It would mean a lot to us. And I know I'm asking a lot. If you guys have three minutes, please give us a review on iTunes. It can change the game for us. It feels good. And it feels good to do. I highly recommend it. And check out Ryan's short on uh, WQ. It's his HQ parody. I've seen it like 10 times. It's fucking hilarious. All right, guys. That's it for us today. Uh, next week, we're doing Network, so hell yeah. Fuck yeah. Uh, all right, so that's it for today. See you guys later. Peace. Here's Wisecrack <laughs> from Hollywood, hey, California. <laughs> Peace, dudes. <laughs> <laughs>